There we go. Um, I hope this will be reasonably complementary to, to what Osman has talked about. And what I'm going to try and cover here is I'll give you about five slides with data on here, which is why I think there are very good reasons to be a cautious optimist about African agriculture. These are not quite the same slides that Osman has got, but they obviously point in the same direction. And I think you will see one or two surprises in there, uh, particularly if you're familiar with some of the graphical representations of African agricultural performance that tend to litter many reports that I see. And these graphs will be rather different. Then I'm going to briefly look towards the future. And it is cautious optimism because there are a lot of things up there which you have to put in a box called a bit scary. So there are some fears ahead, but there's also opportunities. And there's more slides on the opportunities than there are on the fears, if that's a simple totting up. And then finally, I'm going to try and conclude by saying when you look at the balance of the fears and the opportunities, what are the critical points that take you towards heaven and steer you away from hell. So, okay, let's have a look at this improving record. Now, that's the first graph I'm going to show you. What it's showing is this is total agricultural production in Africa from the early 1960s to the late 2000s. And what we've done here is we've separated this out by the component regions of Africa. And there are two big things to note on this particular graph. One is there are two regions which are clearly doing an awful lot better than the rest. And those two regions are North Africa and West Africa. Dramatically different uh, performance on that. And the other thing that you need to note on this is there is a break in the series. And there is a distinct acceleration which is happening round about here which is the early to mid-1980s. Now, I don't need to explain what that probably was because Osman said it is those painful reforms is the only thing that I can find that is coincident with this. And if we had a more technical discussion, I'd show you some graphs of net protection rates for Africa. And the net protection rates turn the corner just as those growth rates start to accelerate. So when you go away from a continental position and you start looking at the regions, you find some regions have, be, have apparently been doing remarkably well over the last 20 odd years. Here's another way of looking at it. This is a more recent trend. This is just from the early 80s, from the point of this acceleration. And this is a rather different chart because it's not looking at total agricultural production. This is food production per head, the heart of the green revolution, the food security fears about the future of Africa. Now there's several things to look on this chart. The big thick line there is Africa as a whole. Now I often hear it said that Africa is running out of food per head. Um, unless these statistics are utter and complete junk, that simply is not true. That index shows 15, 16, 17, 18 percent more food being produced per capita by the time you get to the middle 2000s compared to where it was a quarter of a century earlier. Once again, there are two regions surging ahead, and that is, of course, North and West Africa. But you'll also see a dotted line running through the growth trend for those two regions. What is that dotted line? That's the Asian performance. Now, those of us working on Africa, people use Asia as a stick to beat us. Well, as far as I can see, there are two bits of Africa there which have done every bit as well as Asia has done over that quarter century. Now, the problems are clearly, the disappointments are in those other parts of Africa, and particularly Middle Africa and Southern Africa. There is some sign that Eastern Africa may be beginning to accelerate in a similar way to the way that we've seen in West and, and North Africa uh, starting 20 years ago. Now, very frequently, another stick that we're beaten with, those of us who are optimistic, is we're told, yes, OK, you can find some statistics on Africa that suggest things are getting better, but that's just because people are plowing up more fields with probably environmental negative consequences. There's no real productivity increase in Africa. Well, 
Take a look at this. This is an index of yields. It's a very crude index of yields. It's the total value of agricultural production divided by the very poor estimates we have of agricultural area for those regions of Africa going back to the early 1960s uh, up to the present day. Well, you can see that those that crude index of yields, it's a massive increase over those 40 years. It's a complete fiction that yields are not increasing over that time. This is value of production, but it's value of production in constant prices. So it's not a game, game in prices. And once again, the two regions which have really surged ahead got the biggest increase in yields. So I'm not at all sure it's true that yields are not rising in Africa. But one of the themes that you get from the statistics is don't look too much at continental statistics. And by the same token, one might say, be a little bit careful with these big, big five regions that we've got on some of those. So let's go look at a little bit of country data here. And this is one of my current favorites because it is so utterly astonishing. Look at that graph at the top. It goes from the 1960s to round about 2007. And what we are comparing there is total production of cereals in Burkina Faso against total production of rice in Vietnam. Put onto an index basis so you can see the two together. Now, Vietnam, as some of you will know, is one of the stars of the Asian Green Revolution. There's only Indonesia which has done better than Vietnam in terms of cranking up its production of rice. And the difference between Vietnam and Indonesia is not great. So Vietnam, we all know, wonderful. Have a look at Burkina with its cereals. It's actually beaten Vietnam over that period. It's quadrupled its production of all cereals since the early 1960s. And then the graph down here is for those people who say, yeah, but the Burkina Bay just got out the ox plows and, you know, plowed up some more semi-arid land with almost certainly uh, messing up their environment. Well, not true at all. This is an index of yields. Now, you have to put it on an index because, obviously, irrigated rice in Vietnam produces a lot more per hectare than, than producing millet in semi-arid Burkina. But once you put them on an index basis for a fair comparison, oh my goodness, there's hardly any difference. So it's not that the Burkina Bay have just ploughed up their lands. Uh, they've done a cracking good job in cranking up the yields. It's an astonishing story. That's so I call that, you know, Burkina and Vietnam, two green revolutions. Everybody knows there's a green revolution in Vietnam. But unless these statistics are junk, uh, something good has been going on in Burkina. And for those of you who say, yeah, the statistics are junk, there's a lot of field ground truthing. You know, village studies from Burkina confirm the processes that lie behind um, this, this story. I really like dragging out this Burkina story. It's not the only notable success on a country level, because what this says is that where there have been disappointments with African agriculture, it's not a continental, it's not a, a geographical um, constant. You, you have to say, if Burkina can do this sort of performance, being landlocked, Sahelian, semi-arid, then you have to turn to almost any country in Africa and say, how come you don't have statistics as good as Burkina Faso? Um, what did Burkina have specially going for it no special advantage whatsoever, plenty of special disadvantages. And finally on these slides for why one can be a cautious optimist, every time you go looking for small scale things, you can find all kinds of bits and bobs on the landscape where you say, hang on, that's going in the right direction. Uh, here are a couple of examples from Kenya. Uh, fertilizer liberalization in the early 1990s in Kenya has brought fertilizer dealers increasingly close to small farmers in Kenya. It's led to increasing uses of fertilizer by increasing numbers of smallholders in Kenya and with increasing maize yields. Although it's difficult to disentangle that because people are growing maize with quite a few other crops. But any serious attempt to disentangle it shows all the positives going there. And another recent survey in Kenya compares access to services of all kinds. Fertilizer dealers, phones, 
uh, veterinarians, roads, health posts, and so on, over a 10-year period, 1997 to 2007. It is remarkable how much it's improved, and in some of the least served areas of Kenya, there have been the greatest improvements. What does that correlate with, by the way? It correlates with some decentralization in Kenya, passing the money down to district authorities and saying, you do what you, what you want to do. Uh, the revitalization of cocoa. In, in, in Ghana has been a, a notable success. And finally, right at the micro level, this is an irrigated onion field in the middle of Tanzania. We ran some surveys on it last year, and those are the results. You look at the results, and every time I look at those, I say, we must have made a mistake with our sums. Gross margin, $1,000 an acre of irrigated onions, $1,000 an acre. This person here is representing a household um, worker. Implicit returns to household labor, $15 a day. This person here is a hired laborer on a piece rate. Add up the piece rate, $6 a day. So this is, you know, this is real stuff. By the way, how did they get going with the, uh, the, the irrigated onions in central Tanzania? It's a long-standing local initiative. Government has not been absent from the field, but what has the government spent its money on? To some extent, roads and a stable macroeconomy by which traders and farmers can get on with the business. They're providing schools and, 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 and health posts. And it's a wonderful example, these particular villages, of intelligent aid because Jaika the Japanese and Danida the Danes came along and they upgraded the local intake structures, turned them into concrete from what they were before. No changes to the local irrigation management. The scheme was always there. All the donors did was just made it a little bit more technically efficient. So you come across these things and you say, hang on, uh, there are reasons to be cheerful. OK, future prospects. Well, fears. There's plenty of stuff that we know to keep us awake at night. We worry about the environment. The climate change is real and will hit African farmers as hard as it will hit anybody else. There are areas, patches, we never know quite how much or how severe, of environmental degradation. We know that when it comes to technology, that we don't have quite as much technology as we'd like. There are concerns that the, that the easy technical advantages may not be there, and that mitigation of climate schemes let me not explain that, I'm going to come to it a, a, a again, may prove difficult, may not. We worry about changing supply chains. You know, will the, will the increasingly demanding supply chains, led by the supermarkets and so on, impose demands upon small farmers that will exclude them from premium markets or markets completely? Mm -hmm and turn Africa into a place where the only people who can make money off the land are large-scale commercial farmers, uh, leaving the small farmers as marginalized and impoverished. Pandemics, we know only too much what pandemics can do in Africa, and if HIV or AIDS shocked us when it arrived 30-odd years ago, what may be there in the future? Conflicts have been reduced in Africa, but they're still there and there is still the potential for new conflicts to arise. Land grabs have been in the headlines, um, people making preemptive strikes on, 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 on land. Um, this one really worries me, blocked manufacturing. Some of you will have come across the argument that says that Africa's chance to, to, to get a, manufa a competitive manufacturing um, industry have gone because the Asian economies have taken up that window of opportunity and nobody is ever going to get a shout from here on in. Um, true or not true. Rather important for, for farming, and I'll come back to that later. And you can see the kinds of narratives to which, if all these fears were, were, were realized with none of the opportunities, we could see desperate urbanization. People worry about desperate urbanization at the moment, where people are going to the cities for having no other opportunities and living in very unattractive slums with marginalized jobs at best, disaffected youth, and in the countryside, processes of involution. 
um, in the sense of Clif Clifford Hetz on, on Indonesia many years ago, where all of your advances in agriculture are just about enough to keep you going at a subsistence level and don't break you out into a, a, a new stage. Well, those are the fears, and those are actually pretty well rehearsed in the literature. But let's look at the opportunities. And I begin with this one. Demand is a terrific opportunity. And I would argue that there's an awful lot of small farmers in Africa who have been limited by effective demand at the farm gate for many years. They could have produced more, but there was never enough demand for it. Well, urbanization and the kind of economic growth that Osman has talked about are a magnificent opportunity for farmers. Um, regional integration uh, is taking place. And when you get these stories of people in Zambia saying, we're short of maize, and hooking up with an entrepreneur in Uganda who says, that's fine, I've got 5,000 tons and I'll put it on trucks and I'll run it down the road to you. That kind of thing wasn't happening 20 or 30 years ago. The moves towards regional <laughs> integration are not the fastest that you would, you would wish them to be, but they seem to be happening inexorably, particularly in areas of Kamesa and the East African community, ECOWAS as well. And there is a vent for surplus argument. Africa does have an awful lot of potential to produce more. Uh, Asia, as Osman said, is almost certainly constrained. So what are our big opportunities here? The Asian markets, certainly for Eastern and Southern Africa, they're just across the, the Indian Ocean. Asian countries are very, very keen to secure their own supplies of food grains. But they have no such scruples about vegetable oils, which they're importing in huge amounts, or animal feed, which they're importing in huge amounts. Places like Mozambique and Tanzania are facing an open goal, as far as I can see, for exporting those kinds of products across to, to Asia. Biofuels have a bad, bad name in some things. Tropical biofuels are a damn sight better than ethanol in Iowa. That little map at the top there, that tells you all the countries in Africa where you take less than 10% of the currently unused land turn it into tropical biofuels, probably sugarcane, but sometimes cassava, sometimes oil palm, and you could replace all petroleum exports, exports, imports, all petroleum imports. That is a colossal saving, particularly for the landlocked countries where it costs an arm and a leg. You know, take Zambia in there. How much does it cost Zambia to bring in its petroleum imports every year? Less than 10% of Zambian land, new jobs, new activities, and you cancel all petroleum imports. It is possible. Um, and there is unused land. And last week there was the, or the other week, there was the conference on the sleeping giant, the so-called sleeping giant, the Guinea Savannah of Africa. 600 million hectares, 10% or so of it, it, it used. Um, a huge potential, it's the shaded area on the bottom one there, uh, for expanded production, if we can find the way to do it. Uh, what else is in this? Well, the technology one is up for grabs. You know, on one, on one side, people tell us the technical breakthroughs may not be easy to achieve. On the other hand, technical breakthroughs take place. They've taken place in the past. Why shouldn't they take place in the future? Climate mitigation is a real opportunity. Uh, I think there is a dream here that says that African small farmers who can adapt to this, sequestering carbon and keeping that carbon in their farming systems, we could have a world through carbon markets where every farmer is getting fifty, a hundred dollars per hect hectare per year out of an international carbon fund for the ecological services of locking up the carbon. Uh, with enormous benefits to the rest of the world, but direct benefits to African farmers. And irrigation, which for so long in Africa, done large scale, has been expensive and not particularly effective. Everywhere I go in Africa recently, you find small scale irrigation schemes, very often managed by people at village and household level, which are doing the job. There is a lot of water in Africa. There is a huge irrigation deficit. It is something which can be taken up 
um, done the right sort of way, probably small scale furrow schemes and the like uh, for the future. So, by way of concluding, paths between heaven and hell, what may be the key factors that lead us to one place or the other? Well, there's a whole series of things that are external to Africa. Climate change and the way that we handle it internationally. Whether those markets in Asia truly are <coughs> as open as they first <coughs> seem to be. Whether Africa's manufacturing potential is blocked forever by what has happened in Asia. I'm not at all sure it is, but there are some convincing and worrying arguments about that. And whether land grabbing genuinely does happen on the scale that it appears to be, to be planned to be. Uh, there's a big gap between the plans and the realities. Te technology is another big dividing line on this. Um, are we going to get a green revolution for Africa, a doubly green revolution in Conway's sense of ecologically benign, a triply green revolution in terms of being ecologically uh, benign and locking up carbon? Can we get a triple green revolution? And can we have technical means to head off things like pandemics <coughs> that will probably occur in the future? There is a major environmental challenge, and I see that in embracing the agenda of mitigation, which is going to become one of the biggest challenges humanity has faced and a major agenda for the first half of the 21st century. Uh, if we're to have anything like a livable planet, can we embrace this? Can we get the flexibility and ad adaptation of Africa's small farmers to sequester carbon, to reduce emissions, to practically zero on a net basis using perhaps carbon markets or using some other device. Um, will we get the institutional innovations in the supply chains that allow small farmers to get in on some of these co competitive um, possibilities which are there? That's absolutely in the balance. Is it going to happen or isn't it? And finally, and last but not least, Success in the urban and industrial economy. Some people write about agri people who are agriculturalists and they accuse us of being somehow ag agrarian fundamentalists. Well, in the case of Africa, nonsense. Uh, the biggest single stimulus to most farmers is a thriving regional city generating demand for agricultural products and very often producing things that can go backwards to the countryside and provide the incentive to send the resources out of the countryside. Um, that, I think, is probably one of the biggest wishes on the list. And that is the list that we have. Thank you. <laughs>